Dr. Eyal Duhovny, PhD, is an Israeli government licensed tour guide since 2016. He considers himself first and foremost an educator and cross-cultural broker. His academic and professional background in anthropology and international relations framed his guiding, and he adopts a holistic approach to his work, which provides both depth and nuance to his tours. In addition to guiding, Dr. Tukhovne maintains a substrat called an Israeli anthropologist, where he writes about the intersection of history, culture, and politics in Israel. Um, having said that, you're all welcome to join his uh, substrat and enjoy the presentation. Eyal? Thank you very much, Julia. I would like to share the screen, but it's telling me that uh, the host disabled the participant screen sharing. You can do it now. You can do it now. Oh, okay, great. Uh, let me find it. Here we go. Uh, tell me if this, if you guys can see it. Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. All right. Let Not me... full screen, though. Now? Yes. Full great. screen. Perfect. All right. Thank you for that that kind introduction. Thank you for having me back again. I really appreciate it. Today, I'm going to talk about some a little bit more, more I guess, uh, uh, theoretical, philosophical uh, stuff about post-colonialism and anti-Zionism. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to just dive in. Um, so first of all, I also wanted to just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I did this last time, but a shorter version now. I'm based in Haifa, Israel. I was born in Israel, um, but I grew up in the United States. I grew up in Pittsburgh, and I grew up in Detroit area. So if there's anybody who's there from Pennsylvania or Michigan, hi. <laughs> I'm, I grew up in those communities as well. And my background is in anthropology. Um, you can see here on the left, there's a photo of me doing my field work in India uh, when I was doing my research for my PhD. And it was a PhD in environmental anthropology. Here's me with my family. This is already over 10 years old. Uh, my daughter is turning 20 in a week. So it's kind of, you know, <laughs> nostalgic. Um, and as Julia said, I do have a sub stack. And I also have a podcast, uh, which is really about tour guiding, but I just put out an episode also about the war uh, with a tour guide who has been volunteering in a uh, cow shed, which was damaged by the October 7th attack. So if that interests you, podcast, it's called Tour Guide Confidential. Today, like I said, I'm going to talk about uh, post-colonialism and anti-Zionism. And I think uh, the reason I want to talk about it, though it sounds a little bit uh, you know uh, academic I think I'm the right person to talk about this because as an anthropologist not only do I study culture but this is something that I've been following for 20 plus years uh, some of the things that we saw on uh, October 7th already on October 7th in Harvard uh, the student bodies 34 of them signed on to a letter denouncing Israel and there have been protests all over campuses, as I'll talk about in a minute. And so I think that I've seen these ideas filtering through academia. People often, you know, don't realize that the extent to which social ideas, social philosophies impact society. I often talk about it as like, you know, there may be the head might be, you know, uh, like, fields like computer science or or uh, the STEM subjects, you know, science, technology type subjects. But anthropology is an important topic as well because it serves a lot like the neck. It kind of gets you looking in different directions. And I hope that by the end of this talk, you'll understand what I mean by that. So without further ado, most of you have seen this photo. If you're not familiar with what we're looking at here, 
Um, we have the presidents, or, and here there are two former presidents now, of Harvard, uh, Claudine Gay, right in front here, and in the middle, uh, McGill from University of Pennsylvania, and at the end, Kornbluth from MIT giving testimony in front of uh, Congress, where they had a really difficult time saying whether genocide, calls for genocide against Jews would be something that would be against their code of conduct, right? They said it depends on the context, and they kept asking them again and again. They gave this kind of, you know, law lawyerly responses. And uh, I think the reason people found it so galling was that universities today are very much of the place of safe spaces and trigger warnings for everything, right? Every minor uh, thought crime, speech offense could get you sent to uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion authorities or canceled, right? There's cancel culture. So this came out as, you know, very ham-fisted and tactless, especially in, in the wake of the October 7th attacks, right? And I found this, which I thought was brilliant, uh, as you can see on the left here. Harvard student leaves the lecture on microaggressions to attend Kill the Jews rally, right? This is, you know, it, it would be even funnier if it wasn't, you know, at least partly true that um, we've got this situation today. Oops, it moved. We have a situation today where microaggressions are, you know, are taken more seriously than calls for genocide. And as, as the paragraph here says, the university happily hosted the rally for mass murder and rape after being assured that no one would be misgendered, right? <laughs> this kind of black humor. Hate speech has no place here at Harvard, assured President Claudine Gay. We affirm everyone's right, regardless of gender, to feel safe, to express their deep hatred and longing to kill Jewish people. That's why Harvard is more than a school, it's a family. Obviously, you know, this is dark humor, but the point is that, you know, saying that everything depended on the context when, you know, misgendering is taken, is is a punishable offense at these universities, um, really kind of puts it into contrast. And also this article, and you know, this is from like an onion-like paper. This article came out on October 11th. This was two months before they went to Congress and spoke about, uh, you know, the contextual aspects of genocide. And so what we've got is a situation where David Froome rightly pointed out, we have progressives who once argued that free speech is violence, now claim that violence is free speech. So we've got this, you know, shift that we can see on campuses and um, Daniel Al Danielle Allen put it differently and said, there are people who have confused free speech for a culture of intimidation. Um, so we've got the situation where Jews suffered the worst attack since the Holocaust. No, no other day have so many Jews died as on October 7th. And the violence was, you know, unbearable. Anyone could see it. The people who were publicizing the violence were the ones committing it. So there's no question that it happened because they proudly spoke about the violence they were inflicting on the communities around Gaza. And so there's this explosion of pro-Palestinian rallies on campuses. It left many Jewish people feeling, as Yossi Klein Alevi wrote, like the lonely people of history that once again, you know, we're, we're, we're facing this by ourselves that the people who should be our allies aren't stepping up to the plate to defend us, okay? I want to share, hopefully this will work. Eyal, I cannot hear him. Am I supposed hear. to hear? Does it not? Doesn't come through the sound? No. Did you push when you shared your screen to also share sound? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> I Do would I... maybe unshare the screen, and then when you go back to share it, click to optimize for sound. Okay. Let me try that. 
Sorry about that. I didn't realize there was an option like that. Um, okay. Should be like two little share sound on the left. I see. Yes. There you go. Yeah. Share. And now we'll open it up again. Right. And tell me if there's no sound. I'm going to pull it back. It is probably Perfect. the worst yeah. campus that I've seen during all of this. And, and this takes nothing away from what we've seen in Cornell. I'll go through just a couple of the examples of what we've seen, the kinds of rhetoric and, and the threats that have been taking place on this campus. It is embarrassing to me as a son of Philadelphia and as a Jew to see this happening. It is unbelievable that it's happening in America for that matter. So you have a speaker at Penn against the occupation, a rally praising Hamas for a job well done on 10-7. We have at Penn's A.E. Pie House, someone scribbled the message, Jews are Nazis. The Hillel was broken into, the Chabad was vandalized, a swastika was drawn on an academic building. We're watching protests where they're calling for Palestine from the river to the sea. This is calling for the destruction of the state of Israel. They're calling for an intifada, a violent uprising. There's a vigil and a walkout to honor the Palestinian martyrs those that are killed fighting against Israel. And then finally, a faculty senate statement uh, published that was really, I think, uh, the end message was that the university should not cave to Jewish donors who were demanding change. This is unbelievable that it's taking place at Penn. It's unbelievable that it's taking place in America. And it's just a microcosm of what we're watching across the country. Okay, so that's a little bit depressing. I mean, uh, the situation and what he's talking about here isn't necessarily only after October 7th. Uh, we're talking about things that also predate October 7th. But since October 7th, as you can see on the right here, the number of hate crimes has just skyrocketed. The ADL talks about a 360% increase uh, in hate crimes, including uh, 628 incidents against Jewish institutions, 505 incidents on college campuses. And the 2023 will unfortunately be the worst year since records in the 1970s began by the ADL and also FBI records, which have always shown that Jews suffer hate crimes more than any other religious groups. This year will be the worst year ever, 2023 by that is what I mean. And so we've got is a process where Jew hatred has become what is called Salon Fehig. It's a German word which was popular in the 1920s and 30s. It means acceptable in polite society. And so we need to ask ourselves, how did we get to this point where uh, anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism have become acceptable in polite society? Um, before we get into that, one last slide here about the universities, which is that things were not always this way at American universities. In fact, Jewish university attendance, especially in the Ivy Leagues, should be seen as one of the great achievements of American Jews. Uh, all of these universities in the 1920s had a history of uh, limiting the number of Jews in attendance through various means. And if you're unfamiliar with that history, there's a great uh, podcast series by Tablet Magazine called Gate Crashers, which looks at all the Ivy League schools and how they kept Jews out until the 1930s and 40s, all the way through the 50s. And so I recommend you listen to that to get an idea. But the, the point is that Jews did manage to get in. And at one point, almost 25% of the students at Harvard were Jewish. And that was true for many of the other Ivies, 20 to 25%. Now they're down to only about 5% at these institutions. Uh, but college was considered a ticket the Jew the, that's the ticket the Jews needed in order to assimilate into American society, and and colleges were one of the bastions, the most important bastions of liberal thought. Um, so what happened? <laughs> Let's talk about liberalism and anti-Semitism, right? I think we've got an ironic situation here with respect to. Uh, anti-Semitism in particular, because it was actually liberals 
who led the charge against anti-Semitism. Um, in the 19th century, we have this kind of flawed social Darwinist ideas, which puts different people into different racial categories. It was called scientific racism. Jews were classified as a different race, right? And it's because Jews were considered a different race that the Nazis wanted to wipe out the Jews because they didn't want Jewish blood to mingle with the great Aryan race, right? This idea of scientific racism uh, predicated uh, against mingling between different quote unquote racial groups. Even in the United States, there was a race concept. Many people don't realize if you look at immigration records, the ships when they arrived in New York, people were classified by race and Jews were not white. There was a white category Jews were Hebrews. That was the official racial categorization in the United States. They were Hebrews also on the census until the 1940s. Okay? So what happens? What happened was my field, anthropology, and in particular the founder of the field, Franz Boas, fought against racism and probably did more than any other human to fight the concept of racism and differences in race. He was completely opposed to it. There's a story that he was on his deathbed in 1933 when he heard the elections from Germany. He originally was from Germany before he came to the United States. And when he heard that Hitler had basically won the elections, he got out of his deathbed and then spent the next seven years going from place to place to fight the race concept, which he felt was one of the you know, r most dangerous ideas out there, and, and obviously he was right. So in general, liberalism, one of the main core beliefs of liberalism is equality, and that is at odds with racism. But other liberal ideas, when I think about liberalism, I'm talking about classic 20th century liberalism. Other ideas include the idea of human rights, Right? So liberalism is opposed to racism because of human rights, a belief in tolerance, a freedom of religion in a secular state, so secularism, freedom of speech, the rule of law, and social justice, which is very important for minority groups. So it's not hard to see how classic liberal thought was, you know, as they say, quote unquote, good for the Jews. Okay? And in fact, in the early days of Zionism, the movement was considered kind of a darling of the left, right? It was a socialist movement. So for many on the left, the kibbutzes in particular represented utopian socialist ideals. This picture that you see here of these women going out to farm on the kibbutz, it looks like it could be from the Soviet Union as well, right? So it was a darling of the left. We were not like today, a problem for the left. Uh, the kibbutz movement and Zionism was considered a liberation struggle. And in this connection, the Soviet Union actually helped Israel during its war of independence by allowing airplanes to be shipped here and weapons to be shipped here. And the Soviet Union had very little difficulty voting at the United Nations for the establishment of a Jewish state. The United States you know, prevaricated for a while there. They were worried about supporting this kind of socialist community out there. Um, and Truman needed some encouragement to vote for Israel in the United Nations, but the Soviets didn't have that issue. Zionism was seen as a national liberation movement and an anti-colonial struggle. Remember, we fought the British and got rid of the British, so we fought the colonizers. And even you could say that we were against the Ottomans, right? We also fought the Ottomans in World War I. And so it was an anti-colonial struggle which should be supported. So what changed? There's a lot of history that changed and that has to do with the Cold War. But I want to go into the intellectual changes that underpin the bigger changes that have happened. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So... Uh, I suggest everyone strap themselves in for an intellectual <laughs> discussion now. Uh, we're going to get right into the philosophies.
that underpin the anti-Zionism and even anti-Semitism of today. So we're dealing here with social sciences. And when we look at philosophical ideas in the social sciences, one of the things that we have to do always is to be in a conversation with past thinkers and past ideas. So if you want to understand postmodernism, you first need to have some kind of a basic understanding of modernism and what that meant, okay? So you can see here, modernism is a philosophy which is associated with a time period of about 1890 to the 1950s, okay? 19th century in particular is a time of great upheavals all over the world because we have a a century, the 19th century, 1800 to 1900, when we experience industrialization on a scale which has never been seen before. And this industrialization causes a dislocation. Many peasants leave their villages and go to the big cities, right? So you have this dislocation happening where you're getting urbanization, people leaving the villages, and it causes a dislo dislocation, which creates a break with tradition. Whenever you have this break with traditions, suddenly new social movements come up and are advocated for. And we see this in art, in literature, in architecture, and in philosophy. We have these new ideas burble up because of this dislocation that industrialization causes. Modernism is a type of idea which is focused on innovation and a break with tradition, but it leads to fragmentation and dislocation. Let me give you an example. When we look at the art of Pablo Picasso, Cubism, Picasso and Braque and others, you can see the dislocation and the fragmentation there, right? It's visible. It's all... Nothing is flat anymore. Everything is broken up. The same with the literature of Joyce, which is fragmented, right? The most important thing that happens in this period is not World War II, but rather World War I, World War I which is the first big shock. And what happens in World War I is that the West, we lose our confidence in ourselves during the war. Before the war, it was easy to think, we're the smartest and the best and the greatest. And all these other people around the world are just primitive and barbaric. But after World War I, no one could argue that. World War I was barbaric. Use of, you know, poison gas and trench warfare. And so this notion of the West being superior was being challenged from West within by Westerners. And it leads to a period of a lot of questioning and doubts. However, even with all the questioning and the doubts, there, there is no, there, they still do not reject the idea of absolute truth, that there's this notion of truth. And they still accept in this period overarching grand narratives that explain reality. So modernism continues the Enlightenment, the ideas of empiricism and positivism. That means things that can be measured. But it's also a break from the past. It's techno-optimist. It believes in the ability of machines and science to make a better world. And it believed deeply in the idea of progress. Today, we no longer live in that world. We live in a world of postmodernism. And it's like we're like fish who don't see the water around us. We may not realize how this affects us every day. But I think if I explain a little bit about postmodernism, you'll see that we're living it every moment of the day. First of all, postmodernism rejects grand narratives, it believes in multiple conflicting narratives. So there's not one truth. There are a lot of different narratives out there. There's just a lot of different possible truths that you could look at, right? It's a relativist approach. Everything is context dependent 
and it's shape, shaped by your own personal experiences. So if you're a guy, you'll see things a certain way. And if you're a woman, you see things slightly differently. And if you're a black woman, it's slightly different than, a, than that. Everyone has context dependent experiences and that shapes the way they see the world and creates different narratives, right? There's a focus so everything is subjective and relative, and there's a focus on cultural, historical, and social contexts. Postmodernism tries to deconstruct reality. It rejects traditional categories and binaries. It talks a lot about fluidity, right? You heard people talk about gender fluid. That's where this comes from. It's from postmodernist thought, open-endedness and fluidity, because Postmodernism believes in the instability of meaning, and so it celebrates diversity. There's not just one right way. There's not one culture. There's lots of different cultures, and they should all be celebrated. So we celebrate diversity, multiculturalism, hybridity, where you join different cultures, right? Fusion foods. You take different, like, you mash up different types of food, foods. That's very postmodern in its perspective. Um, and it's okay with multiple perspectives existing at the same time. It rejects the idea of a single cultural dominant artistic paradigm because the goal ultimately also is the goal of art is to subvert cultural norms and to challenge expectations through irony and humor. Modernism seeks to create new stable forms but postmodernism revels in destabilizing. It's relativist. So it doesn't only reject traditions, but it says we can't create new traditions. That's a lie. Everything is in flux. And it rejects the idea of linear progress, empiricism, and science. After the dropping of the atomic bombs, how can we trust science anymore? It rejects these kind of grand narratives like progress. So where does this come from? At the bottom of every one of these things, <laughs> ultimately, I already told you, Franz Boas fought racism. Uh, Franz Boas was a German Jew. The bottom of postmodernism is Jacques Derrida, a French, Algerian, Sephardi Jew born in Algiers in 1930, he could be considered, he's typically considered the father of postmodernism. You can see he was very suave and debonair. He's got his pipe here. Derrida developed a philosophical worldview known as deconstructionism. And I'm going to show how this is related to anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism in a couple slides. So he wanted to understand the truth, but the truth in its opposites. He argued that all Western thought is predicated on opposites. So you have masculinity versus femininity, speech versus writing, reason over passion, high culture, low culture, equality, inequality, good, bad, everything is a dichotomy. The world was dichotomy. And he saw everything as a text. Everything could be read as a text, and that makes sense because he was a literary scholar. It also makes sense because he was Jewish and he was looking at things like a Talmudist looks at the Talmud. When you study the Talmud, you're allowed to question and interrogate the Talmud. It's not so holy that you can't talk about it. And he had no sacred cows. He was willing to discuss anything. Um, he argued that our world was too logocentric, that we privilege reason. And that is to the detriment of art and spirit and music. Too much reason was not a good thing. And he rejects the idea of grand narratives. He argued that you should always try to understand the other side of a debate. Always understand both sides of anything, masculine, feminine, reason, passion, were on to something. And both sides were a bit wrong. Both needed each other but there would always be tensions between both sides. In short, everything is, all ideas are confused, contradictory, 
and messy. He called that aporia. You can see he he's relativist. Everything is relative. Uh, he had some absolute truths. He believed that kindness is better than meanness, and cruelty is better than is worse than kindness, right? So he he did have some, but in reality he 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 questioned everything, and he broke with tradition and stable forms. The problem with his approach is that it doesn't leave much place for reality because it rejects empirical or positivistic approaches. It wants to play devil's advocate and it's relativist, right? There's no there, there. What does all of this have to do with politics? To understand that, we need to understand first Michel Foucault. Maybe you've heard his name. He was more of a rock star social philosopher and unfortunately he died of AIDS early on in 1984 which made him more famous uh, because of that. Foucault was a different kind of French philosopher. He was a philosopher of history who took his ideas, who took to heart the ideas of Derrida about questioning everything and deconstructing everything, but he was also influenced by Nietzsche. Uh, he felt that history shouldn't be studied to understand what happened in the past. History should be studied to understand how we should live in the present. There's no point to understand history just to understand what happened. We need, we need to study it to see how it affects us and how, how we can make it affect us today. His rubric of understanding every single thing was the idea of power. Everything could be reduced to power dynamics. So he wanted to deconstruct power and how it's related to the modern state. So he looked at the police, the law courts, prisons, as well as medicine, psychiatry, and sexuality. Let me give you an example, the judicial system. Most people would argue that the judicial system today is better than it was 200 years ago when they used to use the guillotine and hang people in the, in the public square. Right? The justice system today is better than that. He argued that it wasn't, because today much of what happens in the justice system happens behind the scenes. And so power looks like it's kind, but it isn't. In the past, when you would execute someone in the public square, you could have sympathy for that person. And there might be a revolution or a revolt that came out of that. But Today, you don't see it. It happens in closed rooms. You don't see the person being killed. It's all behind closed doors. And so justice today, in his opinion, is worse than it was in the past. Right? Uh, people can't resist what they don't understand and see. You can't have resistance to power when it's all hidden away. The, and from his perspective, the state was more primitive and barbaric today than in the past. He also did this analysis for medicine, and he said, you know, people used to be an organism, but now we're just a bio-machine, where all our different parts are studied by different doctors, right? You have an orthopedist and a neuro, you know, neurologist and a neuro, everyone studying the back, but each one for its their own little things, and they don't look at the big picture. And he said that the state uses its power to even control our bodies through medicine. He would have loved the corona pandemic experience. It proved exactly what he was saying. Vaccine mandates are a way for the government to control us, is what he would argue. It's a, it's, it's a way to impose state power and oppression. And power and oppression exists everywhere, even in speech, which is why we have to police our speech all the time. We have to be careful about what words we use, which pronouns. We don't want to misgender somebody. Do we say West Bank or Judea and Samaria? This obsession with speech and discourse comes from Foucault because he argued that power was everywhere and in speech as well. Interestingly, Foucault himself was not interested in politics. Noam Chomsky despised him. He said he was the most apolitical and amoral person. 
that he ever met because Foucault said power exists everywhere, which means that the liberals are no better than the Nazis. Everyone is using power to accomplish their goals. Power is a neutral kind of thing, which everyone uses, and hence no one is better than anybody else. Okay. So how do we get to where we are today, where, where people are always talking about power disparities? And for that, we have to go to our friend, Edward Said. Said is a Palestinian-American who, who is the father of anti-colonial or post-colonial studies. Said took the ideas from Derrida and Foucault and mashed them up together. Like Derrida, Said was a literary professor and interested in the binary, dichotomous oppositions, like the opposition between the Orient and the West. His most famous book is called Orientalism. Like Foucault, most of his research was actually in history and not in literary theory. Said argued that in the period of colonialism, the West creates a false dichotomy between the Orient and the West. The West was superior, civilized, wonderful. The Orient was inferior, uncivilized, and weird, just strange customs. These false dichotomies were not just ways in which the West stereotyped the Orient, but also a, a worldview which justified the political control and oppression of the Orient. So you needed to think of them as weird and inferior in order to justify your oppression of the states that you were colonizing. So the West claims to be saviors and bringers of modernity, but really what they're doing is creating a form of domination and oppression for the sake of labor exploitation and resource extraction. That's true of anything, even the soft power. So when you write a travel book at that period of colonialism, that travel book is a form of domination and oppression. The same is true of university studies. The, the academy is implicated in the colonial project. Everything, it's totalizing. No one is innocent. Everyone is implicit. Everyone's responsible for what's happening. And it creates what he calls Orientalism which is a unique type of racism, right? And this includes even any negative view of Islam or the Muslim Brotherhood or Islamism. If you have any negative ideas, that is a manifestation of your Orientalism. You can see how this doesn't work very well for Israel, this kind of uh, presentation, this argument. Unlike Foucault, who was amoral, Saeed demanded that you choose a side, and the side that you should choose is the side of the colonized. You must support the people who are being colonized. And the first step to support them is to change the discourse, the way you speak about things, because that is an exercise in political power. So let's take Israel, for example, and we'll get back to it again, but Israel is held up today as the epitome of the oppressive settler colonialist project, which falsely frames Arabs as uncivilized terrorists, quote unquote, while expo exploiting Arab labor, right? Arabs who work in Israel. If we let them in, that's, an ex that's proof that we're exploiting their labor. We're the oppressors, and the oppressors can never be good. And the oppressed can never be bad because they're suffering oppression. Those who orientalize are the racists. We've got two more thinkers. Another literary theorist at Columbia University, Gayatri Spivak Chakraborty. She's also a co-founder of post-colonial studies with Edward Said. She also translated Derrida into English and wrote the introduction to it. She's originally from Calcutta, India, and she married a Jewish man, so she got the name Spivak, which I'll use for the sake of brevity here. Um, her most famous essay is called Can the Subaltern 
speak. Subalterns are the most oppressed people in a society. Subaltern. She questions the ability of the subaltern to articulate their experiences within the frameworks which are provided by Western intellectual traditions. Saeed looked at the oppressors, Spivak looked at the oppressed. And she said, if you've never even been to elementary school, how can you be expected to effectively speak up for yourself? Someone else needs to speak for you. But that's problematic, right? If someone else is speaking for you. So how do you bridge this problem? She, she creates a bridging concept called strategic essentialism. Um, Derrida and Foucault reject categories. They, they see things as more fluid. And that's true in reality. There is no such thing as race, even if it affects people in real life. It's a more fluid concept. But this fluidity is a problem for intellectuals who want to analyze groups like caste or like class or like race or like, you know, feminine, what's going on with women. If there's no real group, then how do you study women? So she says it's true that there is no such thing as a group. Not, there's nothing that unites all gay people. But we can essentialize that group for the sake of speaking up for it. And that's what she calls strategic essentialism. Essentialism is that you are essentially something which you cannot change. The Nazis felt Jews were essentially Jewish. And no matter what they did, whether they converted to Islam or Christianity, they were still Jews. It was in their essence. And Spivak says, yes, we need to think of essentialism in a strategic way so that intellectuals can speak for the different groups out there. So Marxist intellectuals who want to speak for the proletariat can essentialize the proletariat in order to do so because they're doing it for the good cause. So once you do that, once you essentialize and you're speaking, then you categorize people and you begin to rank them. So if you're white, you're privileged, even if you're poor. And if you're categorized as black, you're a victim of race, even when you may, may be the child of multimillionaires, but you're suffering from race. The problem is that this essentializing doesn't take into consideration other aspects. You can only look at one thing at a time in a sense, right? White, black, woman, man. And so our last thinker, Kimberly Crenshaw, comes up with a concept which you may have heard of, which is called intersectionalism, intersectionality. Crenshaw is a, liber is a legal scholar who dubbed the word, you know, wrote the word intersectionality and also critical race theory. She came up with these ideas. Intersectionality is an idea that she proposed back in the 1980s. She was looking at a court case where a group of five African-American women were suing General Motors. And they said that because they're black, they couldn't get to be secretaries in the main office. But because they were women, they weren't allowed to be on the assembly line with the men putting together the, the, the automobiles. So that they were being discriminated against twice and that the courts should recognize this as more than just one type of, of disadvantage. The court, of course, ruled that it could only look at one issue at a time and that they had to go to court against racism and against uh, sexism separately. But Crenshaw said, no, look, it is worse to be a black woman than it is to be a white woman. And hence, where those things intersect, we create this new pyramid which looks at overlapping and interlocking systems of oppression. This is where you get all these multi-hyphenated personalities that you see today in the world, right? So uh, it puts people into these essentialized categories and it rejects universalist ideals which were 
very common in liberal thought, universalist ideas, right? You can imagine Martin Luther King saying that you want people to be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. Crenshaw says that that the worst thing that you can look you could want is a post racial society because everything has to be interpreted either as race or gender or sexual orientation and if you have a post racial society it doesn't take those things into consideration this is a rejection of the black liberal tradition of Martin Luther King and of Frederick Douglass and of Barack Obama the black liberal tradition wants America to live up to its ideals and it wants black inclusion and anti-segregationism. But Crenshaw and critical race theory argue that universal values and rules are just a way of putting wool over people's eyes and it perpetuates racial and other discriminations. Narratives of oppression are given primacy over dominant narratives. So in this case, in our case, Palestinian narratives come first. We should rip up existing rules and norms. And she believes in separate, but truly equal. That you should have separate societies, but each one being equal. And how do you do that? By giving preferential treatment to one group over another, so that you will eventually have equality through equity. And it rejects ideas of progress because racism is systemic and endemic. So 1950, 2023, 1850, it's all the same. There's no progress because racism is baked into American culture. And lastly, free speech is a fraudulent thing that just empowers the powerful. So what happens is intersectionality creates this new caste system which is like an inverted pyramid. Those on top are by definition of higher morality and closer to the truth. So if you're a black woman who is gay and a single mother and in a wheelchair, your truth is more true than someone who's a white man. You have a greater morality in a sense than, than someone else because you have all of these intersections happening. The problem is for Jewish people, we're not considered high enough on this hierarchy. We're just barely above white women. So if the worst thing to be is a white man, a white heterosexual white, male, the second worst thing is a white heterosexual female, Jews are just slightly above that. Jews are white from this perspective, and we'll get back to that. Okay, so where are we today? We're in a post-truth society where Jews, as, because this is our nature, we're, we're so focused on getting the truth out there. We, you know, if only we can explain to people what's really happening here. If only they knew what's going on. We want to share our truth, but we're talking, we're barking up the wrong tree because we're, the people we're talking to, the, the students at university are being taught that there is no truth. Everything is relative. Everything is a narrative. And that any attempt to talk about truth is oppressive. And what you're giving me, you're calling truth, is basically fake news or self-interested. This is why we get people like Alex Jones, you know, who don't, don't believe that, you know, what is it, Sandy Hook happened. You get all these crazy conspiracy theories because we're living in a post-truth society where everything is relative, everything is culturally conditioned. Even now, people are gaslighting us and saying that October 7th didn't even happen. Right? Because there is no truth. So how can you say that that's true? And that's why we get this idea there's no bad ideas, right? no bad uh, perspectives. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, right? That's the old aphorism. Now we have to ask ourselves, why does every university feel like it has to make statements about every issue in the world, including the Middle East and Arab-Israeli conflict? Well, they need to make statements because Saeed said they're implicated in the production of knowledge 
and that they're responsible for colonialism. And so they need to speak up and put their voice out there on the right side of history, which is with the oppressed, meaning in this case, the Palestinians, and not perpetuate colonialism and evil. So these places become politicized. They have to be or risk being accused of being implicit or complicit in what's going on in all these different places around the world, right? Uh, and also this gives them away, the universities, it empowers the universities uh, to put students out there who will act in ways which will support the oppressed, the downtrodden, the ones who are on the top of this uh, suffering Olympics that comes out of the intersectionality idea, right? And they go in and then they start working in government and they march through government and begin to change things from the inside, which is what Gramsci called the long march through the institutions. Or as the right wing calls it, the deep state. What about racism or anti-racism? Well, we talked about strategic essentialism. In terms of Spivak, in terms of race, Spivak thinks you're either white or not white. That's the dichotomy. And if anybody here was wondering, are Jews white? The answer is yes. Jews are white as far as most of these thinkers are concerned. I have a friend who recently was on the campus of Berkeley. Everywhere there were signs that said simply, Jews are white. In case there was any doubt, you should know. And so they're a legitimate target. Jews are white. Uh, though most Israelis on... In reality, if you come to Israel, you'll see most Israelis come from non-white backgrounds, right? They're not from Eastern Europe. The majority of Israelis are Mizrahi or Sephardi or Ethiopian even, right? And we're not really white in the sense that Hitler didn't see us as white. Hitler felt that we deserved to die because we weren't white. So it's problematic in terms of Israel, but we get framed as white. And because Ibrahim Kende argued that you have to be racist or anti-racist, um, we're in a, in a bind here because we're white, which means that we're racist. We're also oppressing the Palestinians, which means that we're racist. You can do a flow chart, but everything comes back to the same point. Jews are white, racist, settler, colonialist oppressors under all of these social philosophies. And it's ironic because throughout history, mo most of history, we've been one of the most oppressed people ever. Uh, but now we're considered an oppressor. You can see one of the things that really upsets the far left, the progressives, is that Jews can hide. They can claim to be Jewish, but also they can pass as white. And so Jews switch in and out of whiteness to deadly effect. Another thing that upsets a lot of minorities is that we're, we're held up as the model minority. They say, why are you guys complaining? Look how much the Jews have suffered, and yet the Jews are educated and, and are economically well-off and politically connected. Why can't you be more like the Jews? Well, that's infuriating to a lot of people. And they look at that and they say, well, Jews aren't really minority. The Jews aren't really uh, you know, oppressed. They're rich all these kinds of things. And so that comes up again and again. And also you should see part of the problem is that everything gets mapped onto the African-American experience, which isn't necessarily relevant for the Jewish experience, which is different. All right. Last couple of slides here. So why does this dichotomy need to exist? Well, because Derrida taught us that everything exists in binaries at its essence. And so Israel is either the oppressor or the oppressed. And Foucault taught us that power is the way we can understand all relations. And Said and Spivak taught us to be on the side of the weaker party. So since Israel is more powerful, it is the oppressor. Since Jews are white, we don't deserve much sympathy. Uh, and since we're white and oppressors and colonialists, we're by definition racist. Everything is very binary and simplistic, but it all comes back. And so Zionism is racism and apartheid because it's racist. 
So Israel is guilty and not worthy of sympathy. That's why all these student organizations can come out immediately because they've already been taught all this and already... It looks like we have some freezing going on. So just please hold, see if we can get him back. Yeah, I uh, let me call him. I'm not sure he realizes that. We are Frozen? Still... Yeah, I'm calling him. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad you're still here. <laughs> well, it was interesting. So, uh, so I stayed. Sorry, I'm back. I don't know what happened. The internet must have cut out for a second. Can yeah, you hear me? Call, yes, we can hear yeah, you. I was about to call you, and here you are. Yeah, okay. we uh, lost you about two minutes ago. Okay, are we still recording? Yes. All right, so I need to go back to this one. All right, this is where we were. We have like two more slides. Um, okay, so the oppressed are worthy of all sympathy, Anything the Palestinians do is considered resistance and part of a liberation struggle. Any resistance to oppression is wonderful. It's laudable. And so even listening to an Israeli speaker or a pro-Israel speaker or a Zionist um, is anathema and should be resisted. Deplatforming is a good thing. You should deplatform people because as Kimberly Crenshaw wrote, uh, she wrote, she, she argued that, that free speech is something which empowers the powerful. Free speech isn't some, because powerful people get the opportunity to speak, so we should silence them through deplatforming. And so again, dichotomies, good, bad racist, anti-racist. Now you maybe understand why American politics has become so polarized because it's based on these philosophical ideas of dichotomies and, and binaries. Um, and it creates, a, what's happened basically is we can't agree on language. And when we can't agree on language, we're speaking past each other and we become polarized and are in our own little echo chambers. So that's what's happened in the U.S. in American politics. And that's what's happened around Israel and understanding what's going on here. We don't even share the same language because language is discourse. And discourse, as Foucault taught us, is about power. We come back again to the same things again. The other thing we need to talk about is power. From Foucault and from the left's perspective, power is always bad. But coming as a Jew who has experienced thousands of years of powerlessness, I don't think that power is necessarily bad. Power wielded in the wrong hands is bad, but power isn't always bad. And the left teaches at university, and I was supposed to teach this as well as an anthropologist, that all power is evil and bad. But I don't believe that. I don't think that's true. You know, there's this notion that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely but not having power is worse. Not being able to be an actor in history is worse. All right, last slide. Uh, well, I should say also about the victimhood Olympics that it's a race. Victimhood is valorized and it's a race to the, the bottom. And there's this notion that there is truth in suffering. Unfortunately, Jews don't get to be considered victims. Even in the case of Jewish women who were raped and brutalized and mutilated, you, could li you should listen to the latest podcast by Barry Weiss in, uh, it's called Honestly, where she talks about this, how Jewish women, because Jews are the oppressors, they don't deserve any sympathy. None of these bodies, like the United Nations Organization for Women, they don't speak up. Why? Because Jews don't categorize as victims because they're white, they have power, they're of the wrong class. And so silence for months, that explains where that's coming from. Um, 
last slide here. I actually come from the liberal side of politics, even if it doesn't sound that way. I grew up in a very liberal environment. I grew up, you know, on the left in terms of my politics and where I voted and, and everything. But I can't be blind to the things that I see around me. I can't write off left-wing anti-Semitism just because it's uncomfortable, right? I never expected the next Kristallnacht to come from the left. I expected it to come from the right. I expected the right with its, you know, violent anti-Semitism to be the problem that we need to confront. And so, because right-wing anti-Semitism is kind of a, a crime of the body, but left-wing anti-Semitism is a crime of the mind. And it's no less dangerous if anti-Semitism is coming from below or it's coming from above. We need to understand the structures, the philosophy, the way these things have developed over time. And yes, there's a question of degree here. Obviously, what happened in Pittsburgh when people going to pray were killed, right? And in the Tree of Life synagogue, that threatens your very existence at that moment. But leftist liberal thought has a lot of cachet, and we need to recognize it also as problematic for Jews and not just write it off because these are the places where we felt most comfortable over time. The other thing I want to say is that a lot of the people who speak out against Israel, they're not bad people, right? You know, the, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. They are people who want to virtue signal or they want to be on the right side of history from their perspective, they're ideologically possessed on some level. They don't even know. You ask many of them, all right, from the river to the sea, which river, which sea? They can't answer that question. They don't know. They just know that they should be speaking up for Palestine because that's the right cause at the moment. And everybody wants to feel like they're part of the right cause and the right movement. The irony is that even those who know which river and which sea don't understand the complexities of this place, and yet they speak up. What do I mean by com complexities? Um, let's look, for example, at this map. If we look here at the river, the Jordan River. The Jordan River ends at the, at the Dead Sea. The Mediterranean Sea is still where it is. But if you want from the river to the sea, that means that Gaza will not be free. Right? Look at the map. It's very simple. You want the river, you could ask these people, even if they can tell you which river, they don't get the, 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 the complexity of this place. And the last thing that I'll say is these ideas begin in the ivory tower in academy. They can seem really, you know, pie in the sky ideas but they go out into the world. They influence the world that we're living in. And all politics is downstream of culture. And so eventually this stuff ends up in our politics. Why do you think we have these progressive uh, members of Congress like AOC and Rashida Tlaib? They're in these places of power today because, as I am saying, politics is downstream of culture and the culture is influenced by these philosophies. Right? If we don't look at this and understand this, we risk being blindsided. And we can't afford to do that. I'll end at that. Wow, hey, y'all, that was incredible. Thank you so much. If you could stop show, uh, showing your screen, we can uh, all okay. see one another. Let me do that. Stop showing there. Uh, Eyal Dodorba, it was uh, it was very complicated, very interesting, and very uh, yeah, actually highlighting things. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, before we move to questions and reactions and everything, I just want to make a short announcement regarding uh, next uh, VFI Educates meeting. Um, I just got it confirmed, so I want to share with you. Next week, we will have a speaker uh, who was uh, fighting in Gaza for the last uh, two months or so. 
Uh, I'm very happy he will be able to join us. Hopefully he will not be called back. He's still in reserves, but now he is home. He's a former student of mine. Uh, he is a settler and he has much to share uh, with you, including, uh, you know, political opinions and mostly his experience as a uh, as as a fighter in Gaza. So it's not going to be easy, but I'm sure it will be uh, very interesting to say the least so that's uh next week okay um yeah uh, so we uh we have a few questions here uh, okay 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 uh hopefully we didn't uh we didn't lose the questions when you got cut off but i don't think so uh oh, harry's right. first do you see harry's first I see, uh, I see Mark even. I see uh, presidents uh, of three Ivy League schools. Oh, uh, so it looked like a quote. Oh, okay. So the next one, Harry, my father's World War II dog. Should I read it? Sure. You can if you want, or Julia can. Oh, you can do it yourself. Yeah, you're great okay, here. I can do that. I don't mind. My father's World War II dog tag shows Hebe, not Jewish. Correct. Yeah. Like I said, in the United States, up until the 1940s, late 40s, Jews were considered a separate race. And you can see that. And there were, you know, um, you know, quotas on how many Jews places could hire. Or they would say Jews need not apply, right? There was racial ideas surrounding Jews. Jews became white later. It's also a process, by the way, for Italians. Italians were also not considered white. Uh, at that time in American history. And over time, Italians became white as well. It, it is a process. Uh, so, okay. So biologically, we are one species by definition. Race is a construct to divide people. Why, with all the communication, that should help understanding. It seems to be creating more sectionalism. Okay. You're absolutely right. Race is a construct which doesn't exist biologically. If you took a bunch of people and took them from the lightest skin to the darkest skin, you could put them all together in a line and you wouldn't have a very good line from which to separate one from the other. And to be like, from this point, we have black people, whereas this point, you know, they're white people or, or brown people or whatever it might be. Also, genetically, genetically within any given quote unquote race, if you take a group of people, divide them up and say this is a race, there's more genetic diversity within the race than there is between the races. So race is nonsense. It's a BS concept. It shouldn't exist anymore. Scientifically, it's been disproven. However, race as a social construct has real world implications and impacts on people's lives and the way people are acted upon in this world, especially in places where race has historically been important. So in England, class is what they use to divide people up. You have different classes of people. Race is a later introduction. But in the US, race, because of slavery, is deeply ingrained and hence impacts people's lives. And so we shouldn't ignore it, right? We shouldn't ignore it. We should understand that it does affect the way people experience this world and the opportunities that are afforded to them. So it, it exists on that level, even though it doesn't exist scientifically, physically as a construct. So, you know, personally, I hate the whole race construct Whenever I was in the U.S. and I had to fill out my census form under race, I would write human. I belong to the human race, and I don't want to use any of these advantages that are supposedly I can accrue. My father is Argentinian, so I guess I'm Latino. And if I wanted to, I could say I'm Hispanic, right? Uh, I mean, you can, you, you can play this game and come up with all this different stuff. I hate it personally. But that doesn't mean it doesn't affect people's lives. And the P... And, Critical race theory would argue all of these people who say we should stop thinking about race, like Martin Luther King or here where you're saying it creates sectionalism, say that is, a, that is the discourse of oppression to tell us to forget about race. 
that's easy for you to say because you're white. But we're not. And so we're always going to suffer from this. And it's built in. It's caked in to the American system of government and politics and everything and society. And so we can't pretend like it isn't there. And to ask us to pretend is another form of oppression. All right. Did that answer that question? I hope so. Uh, the next one. I took anthropology many years ago, so perhaps things have changed. But anthropologically, there are three races. Yeah, that must have been, you took anthropology in the late 19th century, if that's <laughs> if that's what they taught you. Uh, no one talks about Caucasoid, Negroid, and Mongoloid anymore. Maybe under you know Hitler's regime, they talked about things like that. But no. Uh, and there, and that's part of the problem that there are this proliferation of races. So you have, you know, or you have uh, red and brown and yellow, and it's not just these three, uh, and black and white, uh, and it's not a scientific definition as I just explained. Um, and so, no, you know, that's not the real definition that we need to go back to, as it says here. We race has been overused and obscured. Um, and I agree that the other things that you're mentioning here, genocide, Nazi, oppressed, the privilege, have also become overused and useless. Uh, but I wouldn't go back to those three races because those races don't exist either. Okay? When everybody intermarries, there will be no race. Yeah, yes and no. Uh, in, uh, in Easter Island, people discriminated between each other based on their earlobes, on whether the earlobes were connected to their heads or not connected to their heads. And then the society would divide it up into two groups, those that were oppressed based on their earlobes and those who were not oppressed based on their... Humans will always find ways to divide amongst us. Among Hutus and Tutsis, they looked at their gums and based on the color of their gums, they decided if someone was a Hutu or a Tutsi, people will always separate. So even if we all intermarry, there will be reasons to divide us up into different groups. Uh, so that's just human nature. It won't go away. Mandela did not become an oppressor after taking power in South Africa. Is that an exception? Okay, so there are a lot of things that we could say about this. Uh, first of all, from Foucault's perspective, there is no difference between Mandela and de Klerk. Everyone is using power. And he, that's why Foucault didn't want to get involved in politics. He was a quietist, which drove, which drove Chomsky crazy and said he's apolitical and amoral and he doesn't want to get involved in the, in the struggles. He says, yeah, eventually Mandela is no different. And the NA ANC today is oppressive, no less than, than, than you know, the uh, apartheid regime was oppressive. On the other hand, because he's black, because he's from, you know, one of these, I think he was from the Koza tribe, on the intersectionality pyramid, he's got a couple things going for him. And so as bad as he is, He'll never be as bad as the white guys who were ruling South Africa. And hence, he may be a little bit bad because he's in power and he has power, but he's still better than the bad that was before. And so we need to support him. That's how this logic works. He gets a free pass. Yeah. So it's not an exception. It fits within the system as well. And he comes out, you know, smelling roses in the system. Um, yeah, how to argue if everything is relative, including truth. Why should anyone agree with anyone else? Well, that is obviously the question. Why should anybody, you know, in, in, at the end of the day, your truth is just as relative as my truth. And yet we have the political left who will come forth and say, this is bad and this is good, right? So, you know, arguing this, the left, for example, would say homophobia is bad. Well, if truth is relative, how can you make that claim that homophobia is bad? It's no better or worse than anything else. 
So how do the left get around this problem? They get around it by saying, because it's a modernist tradition. I talked about modernism and postmodernism. Modernism and postmodernism oppose traditions. They create these dislocations. And so conservatives are traditional and anti-gay, homophobic. We break tradition and we're in favor of the gay, uh, gay rights movements. And so we're okay. That's how you get around this. So truth may be relative, but traditional truth is less true than non-traditional truth. And that's what we should be supporting. And that's why the left always, you know, oh, you're conservative. What do they mean by you're conservative? It means that you're not, you're, you're mired in tradition and you're not willing to change. Whenever there's the opportunity to change, you'll see more often than not, the left will be there wanting these changes right and that's how they justify their truth over other truth claims because their truth is innovative okay um how can one debate knowing this it's hard because like i said you keep talking past each other because you don't have the same frames of reference first thing is to be aware that you're debating with someone who sees the world in a very different way, right? You're thinking in universalist, liberal ideals of social equality and justice and all these things. And they're like, whoa, social equality, that erases my oppression. How can you even talk about these things? I am i don't know. I have a very hard time myself debating people because we can't reach the bottom point, which is, you know, something that we can agree on. When everything is relative, then there's no firm ground, no firm ground to stand on, and that's why it's so hard. Um, so yeah, I I don't have an answer for that. I I've struggled with this for a long time. Okay, I look for that article about anti-Semitism in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I was taught a form of eugenics in my sociology class in university. We studied families in Appalachia who, through supposed genetics, passed down alcoholism, intelligence, deficiencies, the subject of forced sterilization in order to keep these morons from diluting society with disgust. Sociology was believed to be a science, not simply the study of culture. Wow, there's a couple of things there. First of all, yes, that was a view. Eugenics was common in the 1920s and 30s. Eugenics actually comes out of the United States. Like Hitler gets his eugenic ideas from American eugenicists who lopped this on to social Darwinism. Um, but that's no longer considered acceptable in, in anthropology or sociology for that matter. And that shows you that these ideas change over time. We don't believe that these things get passed on through genetics. Um, Foucault would have loved this because it's another example of how the state gets control of our bodies, right? It decides who should have kids and who shouldn't. It's a, it's a form of oppression and state power. Um, he would have loved, he, he also tore apart genetics, uh, eugenics in his, in his writings. The other thing is sociology, yes, considers itself to be a science, I consider anthropology to be a science, perhaps not in the sense that we come out with an answer which is 0 0.075 or something like that, but it is studied scientifically. Um, and so I reject the notion that anthropology is not a science. It's a science, it's a philosophy of culture, both of those things. Um, yeah, of course, debate terms should be defined uh, before debating somebody, but most people are unaware of their of where they where they they themselves are coming from. That's why I say anthropology is a science because one of the very first rules in anthropology is reflexivity. Reflexivity is to like when you go to a lab, you have to first calibrate the instruments of the lab before you do any experiments in a lab. In anthropology, you have to calibrate yourself because you are the instrument. 
And you do that calibration through reflexivity, which is thinking about the way you think what you think. That's, in essence, what makes us different than animals, right? Animals think, but they can't think about how they think. So what makes us humans is the ability to think about the way we think about what we think. And that is called reflexivity, and that's required before you begin any research. You need to ask yourself what your own prejudices are, what the what color of the glasses you're looking through, what are the what is the color of the glasses you're looking through. And when you debate somebody, that'd be wonderful if you could do that. But most people need to be trained to do that and aren't capable of doing that. And so it's hard to just, you know, meet someone and be able to get to that point with them. They need some training and reflexivity in order for you both to be on the same page when you start. Interesting. Um, it looks like we also have a question. iPhone Q, you're raising iPhone. your hand. Feel free oh, to unmute. Okay. Feel free to unmute if you have a question. For Al, I don't know who this is. They just have their hand raised. All right, anyone else? If you have a question, feel free to unmute. Otherwise, we let Al go to sleep. We have a lot of uh, thank yous, Al, in the chat, and um, oh. some people apologizing that they had to leave before the questions were done. Julia apologizes, but uh, she hopes to see everyone next week. Um, okay, it looks like no one else has a question. I, I just want to say that thank you again yeah. for letting me speak here. And I hope that you found it interesting and worthwhile. These right. are very kind of philosophical topics, but I come from the perspective that you should never underestimate your audience. I don't talk down to people. Hopefully it was clear and understandable. It was very clear. The slides were so helpful. Everyone's saying amazing talk, informative, thought provoking, interesting. Good, so, good. And we so have it all recorded and it should be, that's okay, right, Ayal, that we've recorded? I'm it? very happy that it's recorded. And right. I, and I, last time it was it was uh, put on YouTube and I can yes, share it, it with people. So that YouTube. would be great too. Yeah, it will be on YouTube in a few days once uh, Steve's able to get it up there. Um, he says, bravo, your lectures are the most enlightening. And I can say, Ayal, that your lecture is usually pulling the most amount of people. So oh, thank that's, you. that's something good as well. I think we made it up to almost 70 people, which is really wonderful wow. for this group. So thank you again for coming and for, for engaging us in this way. And um, have a good night. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs> it's late where you thank are. Thank you. Laila Tov. Laila Tov. Good night. All right. Everyone, you're welcome to stay on uh, for a little extra time if you'd like. If not, we will see all of you next week. Thanks for coming.